due process, winner of 25 regional Emmy Awards. Due process is a presentation of Rutgers University, Newark, and Rutgers Law School in Newark. They wanted me to tell them that I did the crime. Well, I told them, I said, if you expected me to tell you that I did it so that you can grant me parole, I said, that ain't gonna happen. All right. Meet prisoner number 201749, convicted of murder in prison for 36 years. I wanna thank you though, again. He's helped other inmates win release, but he hasn't been able to free himself. Ronnie Long, New Jersey's premier jailhouse lawyer on this edition of Due Process. might find them in any prison, those longtime inmates who've done time without wasting time, who spent days and weeks and years in the prison library, earning the honorific jailhouse lawyer. And in a place where real lawyers are hard to get, they become a real source of legal counsel and actual legal work. The most prolific of these has spent 35 years in state prison, insisting he is innocent. Meet Ronnie Long. I know one day I am going to be free because I have the truth on my side. And, and the truth is? The truth is I'm innocent. I'm here for something that I didn't do. Ronnie Long, high school dropout, convicted of murder in 1982, still in state prison where we first found him 12 years ago. He was already the quintessential jailhouse lawyer. His long string of clients his fellow inmates. I want to thank you though, again. What he was able to do is take what happened, my version of it, put it within them documents, which is, which is hard, but he know how to address these things and bring it out. Lucky for you. Very lucky. So instead of having a 60 year sentence, he has a 30 year sentence and he's, he's, he's up for parole any time now. Because of the work you did for him? Yeah, because of the work I did for him. It was first degree murder at first until Ronnie, he's seen a lot of mistakes in my trial that he could get my case overturned. I've gotten a lot of cases overturned. I've gotten guys out who were serving life sentences. So that's what I do. I do law work. He helped you get out? He helped me get out. He helped not only helped me get out, but he also educated me. My life is not being wasted. But for 36 years, it's been lived behind bars. You know, it's either you survive or you don't. Five of those years on death row. Okay, the death penalty is gone. It came and left, but I'm still locked up. Because the inmate Ronnie Long's been unable to help is himself. And you've gotten guys out. Right. But you can't get yourself out. Well, that's the irony. You know, it's the old adage, the jailhouse lawyer can get everybody out except himself. Outrageous. I mean, you know, when is enough is enough. I mean, um, you're talking about an individual who have, uh, you know, who claim his innocence, and I believe would know, would, would be on a shadow of a doubt he's incarcerated for a crime he didn't commit. Tyrone Barnes, once a fellow prisoner, another jailhouse lawyer, now a successful paralegal. He was once mentored by Ronnie Long. I have a mentoring group here, and it's the best part of the week for me. Now he's part of the effort to set him free. Ronnie Long has played a major impact and, and, and love throughout the entire prison system, well respected, and, and that's why we're fighting hard for his release. What I've been saying all along from the beginning, it's not me, y'all had the wrong person. And eventually, everybody's gonna know he was telling the truth. But the courts have not concurred with what Long calls the truth. It's about race. And he points at what he says are the obvious reasons why. It took the jury an hour and a half to find me guilty, and it took them about an hour to give me the death penalty. And it was a good day for hanging. Young, black, angry, and 
I was the perfect defendant. There was DNA evidence, Long insists, evidence that was lost for years. And once it was found, he says, the state has consistently refused to test. I'm still fighting for DNA, even right now. And that's just one of his lines of attack in state courts, in federal courts, with anyone who will listen. How many motions, petitions, letters, how, how much have you done in the last 35 years? Nonstop. Hundreds of pieces of paper filed? Thousands. Thousands. The courts do not want to have to deal with all this. I understand that. And that's the reality of the system. A system that swings on the ubiquitous plea deal. Long says he, too, was offered a plea. If that's the case, I could have took a plea bargain years ago and gotten out years ago. You were offered a plea bargain? I was offered so many plea bargains. They kept coming lower and lower and lower and lower. What's the lowest you ever got? Ten years. Do right by society and humanity. Ronnie Long shouldn't be inside New Jersey State Prison. It's either you're going to stand firm or you're not. There is not one tiny shred of evidence to link me to any crime. Uh, and the star witness was a jailhouse witness who said I confessed to him. Who later recanted. Who later not only recanted, but he was captured on hidden camera by uh, another report. And he admitted that he lied. And they told him what his story would be. Didn't help you. But the courts didn't want to hear it. So it looks like. You are not going to make pro if you, Ronnie Long, probably the best jailhouse lawyer in New Jersey, can't make any progress in 35 years with the courts. That's not going to be your way out. Well, the truth is bigger than people, and it will come out. Still, exoneration is not the only way out. For more than a dozen years behind these walls, preparing legal arguments, working in the kitchen, singing and playing keyboard in the prison choir, Ronnie Long has been eligible for parole. The reason, he says, that he's been denied is his insistence okay. on innocence. I would never sell myself out. I would never tell the parole board that I committed a crime just so that they can might think about recommending me for parole. So it ain't going to happen because I didn't do it. You know, so that's the question, Sandy, whether or not they release him in, in the body bag or he'd be able to walk out of New Jersey State Prison. I would love to see their faces when I'm ultimately exonerated. Which you believe will happen. Which I believe will happen, and that's what keeps me going. And there are other things that keep him going, too. When he's not doing law, he works in the kitchen, he sings and plays keyboard in the prison choir, and most important, he says, he mentors young fellow prisoners, not just trying to win their release, but trying to make them stronger, better men while on the inside and when they get out. And so I turn to my friend Larry Lusberg, a longtime fighter for all kinds of just causes, including prison reform, with my bottom line question. Guilt or innocence aside, why would somebody like Ronnie Long, eligible for years for parole after 35 years served, still be in prison with little chance of getting out? Quite honestly, Sandy, it's because our system is dysfunctional. Um, in New Jersey, which is otherwise a pretty progressive state when it comes to criminal justice, we just are not doing right by the parole system. People like Ronnie Long should be out, but the way the parole system works is flawed in very significant respects. First and foremost, and we see this in Mr. Long's case in particular, if you are innocent, and if you tell the truth and deny your innocence, you're not permitted to get parole. And you can't say, I didn't do it, but I've been a model prisoner, I've been here for 35 years, I'm eligible, let me out. That's the reality. It's not the rules. It's not the way they're written. In fact, uh, to prepare for today, I went and actually looked at the parole regs and saw the 23 factors that determine whether someone does or does not receive parole. And none Remorse. of them. Remorse. You must have expressed remorse, right? Well, that's not even one of them because the parole system is all based on the notion of recidivism. If you are not going to recidivate, if you're not going to commit another crime, then that is the single most significant factor in terms of whether you do or don't get parole. But it, how should that be judged? So it's judged by a whole number of things, including your parole plan, 
the extent to which you participate in programs in prison, and any number of other factors which Ronnie Long would clearly satisfy. Absolutely. He participates <coughs> in absolutely everything. Right. I saw how well he was getting along with the guards, and I said, you've got a special relationship, and he said, well, I cook for them. Yep. This is uh, the perfect parolee, it would seem, except that he says, no, I'm not going to tell you I'm sorry because I didn't do it. So think about it. He's being punished, that is, required to stay in jail, in prison, without his freedom for years more for two reasons. Number one, because he insists he's innocent, and number two, because he's, he's not willing to lie about it. Let me tell you that in this country today, any day, hundreds of people are going to courts, federal and state, and confessing, and, and saying they did something that they didn't do. Why? Because it keeps them from going into prison. The system sets them up for it. That's right. If you're threatened with, hey, you know, you could go to prison for 15 years, but, you know, we'll give you five, what are and, you going to say? And our system, to a certain extent, recognizes that. So we do have a way to withdraw guilty pleas. And we all know, it's a fact, that innocent people are found guilty. That is to say, this is what the Innocence Project does. There's all these exonerations. And, and we see from the piece that Ronnie is seeking that exoneration, and I hope he gets it. Um, but until he does, the system is going to believe, the parole system is going to believe that the criminal justice system is accurate and that only guilty people are convicted. And Sandy, that just isn't so. And because it isn't so, and because the system refuses to recognize that, people like Ronnie Long sit in prison for years longer than they should, and they do it illegally because the truth of the matter is, whether or not you're, you are willing to say, I did something that you didn't do, should have nothing to do with whether you continue to be in prison. What it should have to do with is what programs you participated in, whether you're cooperating in your own rehabilitation, all the things that Ronnie Long has shown himself to do. I and mean, this is a person who, do you have any doubt, will succeed in the outside world? Do you have any doubt, won't commit another crime? How many have? people do you know who would pick him <coughs> up as a backroom guy, as a paralegal? Now, uh, you know, we saw in the, in the piece, I mean, people, th th there are people who get that second chance. People I whom know. he trained. It's amazing. And I know we've hired, in my program, we've hired paralegals who had emerged successfully from prison and did a wonderful job and never did anything wrong again. Ronnie would be one of those guys. It's a waste of a tremendous human resource in his case and many others, unfortunately. You know, the innocence thing is so interesting because I think there was a time of a sort of blind American innocence, if you will, that, oh, anybody who is convicted must have been guilty. Mm -hmm. But the Innocence Project, DNA, proved to us that that's not so. Right. And I don't think it's unreasonable to think as much as 10% of the population in prison is innocent. Not only that, but we also know that some of the people who are actually innocent and sitting in prison actually pled guilty. Yeah. So what we know is that people will lie to achieve their freedom. And Ronnie Long is one of those people who has sufficient integrity that he won't and he's being punished for that as well. So there's a tremendous irony in his case and in all the many cases where people are just deemed not to have sufficiently accepted responsibility even for acts that they did not do. And although he felt and I guess continues to feel that there was a cigarette butt that would have exonerated him, but there's been all kinds of blockage to getting DNA, the fact is that his wasn't a classic DNA case. Mm -hmm. And so there haven't been places like the Innocence Project stepping up to say, hey, this is a perfect right. case for us. Not every case is, can be resolved through DNA. Sometimes there's other flaws in the system that come out, such as faulty eyewitness identification, which we know is deeply flawed, or um, jailhouse snitches who, who will, to achieve their own freedom, will say that somebody said something to them that was incriminating. There's a lot of deep-seated problems in our system. Um, but one of them, for sure, is the notion that somebody has to admit to something they didn't do in order to get their freedom. Um, you're right that we uh, we have the pendulum has swung back towards at least recognizing that the system the is flawed. Yeah, and that's a good thing. And I'll tell you another good thing: it's it, the system has swung back towards the idea that we should allow people to be released into the community with appropriate services that sometimes are provided and often are not, but it can be available so that. People don't have to serve out um, their long terms. Um, but, but, in, but in New Jersey, parole has actually become more uh, rather than less difficult to achieve. In recent years, fewer people it are getting paroled. It has stalled, paroled. hasn't it? It, it, it? It's worse than that. It's gone backwards. Just a few years ago, 49% of the people who had parole hearings were being released. 
Today, that number is closer to 30 percent. So why are we doing that at the same time that we want to reduce the prison population and have, have actually made some inroads there? Yeah, it's really hard to know. Um, to me, it's a, a rational response, and, and, and I don't think that there's a, a good reason for it. Um, I think that there's always a fear on the part of parole boards that if they let someone out and they do something horrible, you're going to have the you know, old Willie Horton type scenario where they'll go out and commit a crime. So the conservative thing to do in any case is to keep the person in prison. Um, but it's the wrong thing to do, and it's the wrong thing to do in cases like Ronnie Long's, and it's the wrong thing to do in dozens of other cases where people ought to be given a second chance, and that'll begin with a parole process where, after all, they can go into the community with some supervision, as opposed to just being released with no services or support whatsoever. So since you've just looked at the regs, tell me if this is legal. Ronnie insists that Another big reason why he's never going to get parole is because he originally had the death penalty. That, he says, is used against him in the parole board. Mm -hmm. Are they allowed to do that? There's just no question but that the fact of, and I have another client, Anthony DeFrisco, who's in precisely the same situation, who just was denied his parole after 30 years of his sentence, um, and it, that's another story for another day. Um, but there's no question but that we, we treat people who originally faced the death penalty differently than people who didn't, even though we've now repudiated that punishment. Yeah. And we repudiated it in part because it wasn't working. Um, we understood that it was an unjust punishment. We understood that it was a punishment that was being imposed disproportionately based on race. And we resentence people so that they do become eligible for parole. Right. right. And, and that's true of both Ronnie and of, of, of Anthony. I mean, they, they, they have parole available to them. And yet, the fact of their original offense is being held against them in a way that it really shouldn't. Now, let's be honest. These are homicide cases. And so they are the most serious crimes. But throughout the world, sentences of 30 years, think about that for any, all of your viewers, what 30 years of your life behind bars must be like. And then to be told, you need to do some more before we're going to release you, even when you've done everything that you possibly could or should have to show that you were in fact rehabilitated, to show that you were in fact ready to reenter society. There's something very unforgiving and sad about that. And I hope the pendulum continues to swing in a way that uh, engenders a more rational and, and, and merciful system. And, and it obviously doesn't have a lot to do with, at least if Ronnie's case is an example, of how you've performed in prison. He's had one infraction in 35 years. So that is one of the factors that's supposed to be considered as one's disciplinary record. Um, but you have a situation where there's all these factors, these 22 factors, including that one, one that's not named, which is that he's unwilling to admit to an offense that he didn't commit, is the one that outweighs all of them. And that's his real complaint. I mean, look, there are times when a person, when the evidence against someone is so overwhelming that it's in fact the case that not admitting to it uh, does demonstrate some lack of remorse or acceptance of responsibility. But that decision needs to be made in a nuanced way based on the particular facts of the case. And Ronnie's case is an example of a situation where that isn't true. Now, let me just say, you know, the, what I'm saying to you here, what Ronnie is saying on the video is not, has not been accepted by the courts. No. I mean, so far they have rejected his appeals, but that's also fairly routine. And, and he's done a lot of them. I can tell you, he has done so many that he has lost count. Yeah. No, I know. I saw, in, uh, you know, on his interview that he talked about, I think he said it was thousands of pages, and I believe that. Um, and, he, and, he, and I've seen Ronnie's work, and it is really excellent. Um, I mean, he's the kind of guy who has tremendous potential on the outside, and that should matter. Um, that should matter more than your unwillingness to admit to something you didn't and do. And he's got a family mm -hmm. that wants him back, right. and he's got a job that he can go to, choice of jobs. Right. I mean, this is a guy who's set up for success, right. except that he can't get out. And, and sadly, while there are many who don't have those opportunities when they get out, um, there are others, many others, who are in Ronnie's position, who really are, are human beings with great potential. Um, and instead of 
um, exploiting that potential, instead of giving them the opportunity to realize that potential, we as a society warehouse them and leave them in terrible places um, where actually it's incredible that they don't have disciplinary records because those are hard places to live. Oh, I can only imagine. The parole board, I can't imagine that the parole board just does its own thing based on its own will. Where does this pressure come from not to let people out? It's got to be coming from someplace else. Well, uh, again, I think that this is an ethic that has been infused into parole boards around the country, which is that it's worse to make a mistake and allow some one person to go free who commits another crime than it is to do the right thing by the dozens, scores, hundreds of, of other people. Um, our parole board also has been able to function as it has in part because it's done so pretty much in secret. It's mm -hmm. among the more opaque agencies of New Jersey government. Um, the disposition of their cases, the race of the particular potential parolees, um, and other important facts are not made available for the state to scrutinize and for policymakers to think about. Now, I will say we have a new and progressive administration in this state. My next question, does the parole board serve at the pleasure of the governor? Well, the, well, the governor does get, to make, uh, does get to make appointments to the parole board. And this can people be, be removed? They, they, no, they have to. They serve out their terms. But 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 when they do serve out their terms, um, I, I am confident and very hopeful that this governor will appoint a parole board that will understand real philosophy of of punishment in, in, in our society. And as it's as the pendulum has swung to a, a system that is more forgiving, or at least that grooms people to resume places in society where they can be productive and law-abiding citizens once again. Where do you think something like access to parole falls in the priorities of this administration or criminal justice reform in general? Is, for instance, is parole addressed in the voluminous reports that came out from his uh, transition? Not parole per se. Um, but there are a number of other progressive law and, uh, criminal justice reforms that are set forth in the transition plan, um, including uh, a reentry task force that would be, would be one in which the heads of many agencies, including the parole board, would participate in an effort to enhance people's opportunities to reenter society um, as gainful and em employed citizens with health care and the necessary, all the other necessary supports, housing and the like. And do you think this is something that falls high on the list of priorities? Well, we'll see. I mean, the administration is new. Um, nothing has happened yet, but um, there are important uh, things that the administration is doing every day. We're very hopeful that one of the ones that will come about soon will be in the area of criminal justice. Another one that the administration has been considering and is part of the at least the transition plan is another look at mandatory minimum sentences. Time. It's time, isn't uh, it? Yeah. And, and there has been a sentencing commission in place to look at those sorts of issues for many years now, but the Christie administration did not make appointments to that commission and it Correct. essentially has not functioned for the last couple of, of terms. So the idea and is mandatory minimums, just for those who might not know, is essentially taking the uh, prerogative out of the hands of the judge and saying this is what you have to do. Exactly. In certain cases. It, historically, in, One our minute left. in our system of justice, uh, judges could weigh all of the facts and circumstances regarding the offense and the history and characteristics of the offender and impose a just sentence. Mandatory minimums just punish and often punish in a very serious, severe, and draconian way. Um, and really is what underlies these long sentences. These were knee jerk kind of law and order extremes that we're still stuck with. We are, but it is, it, it does give me hope to see policymakers taking another look at that, understanding whether it's for financial reasons or reasons of justice, thinking about whether mandatory minimums are the right thing and convening good, intelligent people to think about an alternative system. Larry Lusberg, it is always a pleasure. Thank you for your insight, and my thanks to Ronnie Long for sharing his story. Issues of justice and injustice, they're what we do here on Due Process. So we hope you'll join us next week and every week. For producer Tanya Bentley and all of us here, I'm Sandra King. Thank you for watching.
Some people say that you are the premier jailhouse lawyer in New Jersey. Is that true? I've heard that before. So tell me what that means. What have you done with that? What's, what's gotten you that title? I guess it's because I've gotten a lot of cases overturned. I've gotten guys out who were serving life sentences. And I've had the parole board reverse for other people, and they don't know that's me. So that's what I do. I do law work. Um, it's not a title that, you know, that I'm looking for or anything like that. And I don't have any money. People come to me because they know I'm going to help them because it's in my heart. And you've gotten guys out. Right. But you can't get yourself out. Well, that's the irony. And, you know, it's an old adage, the jailhouse lawyer can get everybody out except himself. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.